the others will join us. Okay, well, we were talking about different pulse sequences and going to some of the uh, uh, more sophisticated and, and recent pulse sequences. I think the last one we talked about was uh, ideal, I believe. And then uh, another one, and this is different from what we've talked about before, and we don't really use it much. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure we have it available in any of our scanners right now. It's a, it's a thing called Viper. It's a vastly undersampled isotropic projection reconstruction. And, and the other thing that you can do in, in MR imaging is not use Fourier transform imaging like we've talked to about uh, uh, the 2D or 3D Fourier transform, but you can take a gradient and project the image into one plane uh, and, and do this all the way around and use CT projection reconstructions algorithm and reconstruct the images just like you do or very similar to the way you do with the CT scanner and, and doing that. So you just, you vary the, the, the gradient so you'll project the uh, planar image in one direction and then, and then do it like, a lot like a CT scan. And when you do this, you can get isotropic resolution in a relatively short period of time uh, by just doing projection reconstruction. And you can also get various types of contrast uh, to, uh, using different types of fast scanning techniques. And this would be a Viper image up in the upper right-hand corner. And we can see the uh, fat sat images and uh, a proton density image here on the right, uh, T2 fat sat. So it can actually give very good contrast relatively rapidly with high resolution using a Viper type technique. <clears throat> And I'm surprised that this is from 2006. Uh, I really haven't used this much or seen it catch on much, though. It's, I think it's a good technique developed at uh, the University of Wisconsin, I believe. So let's go to the next technique. Uh, <clears throat> and that's basically just to show you that you can do other things between, besides Fourier transform type imaging that we've talked about. But the Fourier transform is really a very efficient way to do imaging and, and magnetic resonance. So let's move on to diffusion imaging. Uh, Sheila, what's diffusion imaging? Um, I think diffusion is based off of a, a T2 sequence um, where it can see restriction when you look at um, pretty much it shows any restriction of water, movement of Brownian motion in water um, in a cell so if there's any restriction then it looks um, it demonstrates increased signal on diffusion imaging oh, good. so diffusion is basically if you take a water molecule and you put it into a three-dimensional matrix of wildly vibrating large molecules it gets bounced around and it can uh, it, it can then move away from a given location over a period of time and it's kind of a random walk random motion uh, but the more time you you take uh, the more it will uh, randomly diffuse away from the position it began in, as long as there are no barriers. If there, if there are barriers, however, then it's not going to be able to move. So if there's a cell membrane there, it's not going to be able to move beyond the cell membrane. So instead of diffusing like it would in normal tissues, it would be stuck in one location. So Susie, how do you think we can go about trying to image uh, uh, or create an image whose contrast is based upon the amount of diffusion occurring with the water molecules. How do we create an image? Yeah, so if we do, if we want to do a diffusion weighted image, how, how could you think about doing that? What kind of pulse sequence would you do to do that? I honestly don't know. Sorry. So, so the, the way we can uh, try to get an image that's based upon diffusion is really do the following. You give a 90 degree pulse that we've all talked about. Then if you put on a very strong gradient after the 90 degree pulse, you'll deface all the spins. Then if you do a 180 degree pulse, you'll, you'll, you'll get ready for the echo. And then if you put in a reverse gradient, then all the spins that are exactly the same location will be, their phases will be reversed and the, they'll all be back in phase at the time you do the, the phase encoding and get the echo. If they're moving, however, then the, they'll be in a different position from the first gradient to the second gradient, and therefore they'll, get, they'll have a different uh, 
uh, instead of giving a negative gradient to put them back in phase, they'll get a different negative gradient the second time around, and they'll end up out of phase. So if you put in a very strong gradient here, the exact reverse of that gradient at this point, anything that's not moving will be rephased, and it'll give us a signal. If, however, they're moving and they're in a different location, they won't come back into phase, and their signal will drop out. So, so this is the way a diffusion image works. And typically, we try to do it as rapidly as possible here. So you, you do fast spin echo imaging or, uh, in order to get uh, uh, many echoes here so that you can do this efficiency. And often, you do a gradient echo type, uh, a very rapid uh, gradient reversals to uh, collect a lot of images here. So often, these can be obtained very rapidly. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can determine the sensitivity of the sequence for, for motion by determining how strong the gradients are. So if you put on a really strong gradient here and a really strong reverse gradient in this location, then small diffusion will drop out and you'll be very sensitive to diffusion. If this is a weak gradient on both locations, then you'll be less sensitive for, for motion. <clears throat> Obviously, if you have too strong a gradient, uh, you're, you're, you'll get to a point where even very minor normal motion will be, will be dephased and you'll end up with no signal and you'll end up with a black image. So you, you determine the strength of these gradients based upon, you know, uh, uh, electronically what you can do and also just how sensitive you want this to be. And, and typically, uh, typically you want to have higher gradients in the brain and lower gradients in the musculoskeletal system in order to preserve uh, uh, signal to noise. So we tend to use more of a, uh, the, you determine this by what's called a B value. Typically we use a B value of about 1,000 in the brain and typically around 500 in the musculoskeletal system if we're doing that so that we don't lose as much signal in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, and Bijan from France is one of the early developers of uh, the diffusion imaging type sequences. So this is just another example where you put on the two gradients here uh, that reverse one another. And then here's what's called an echo planar. What you do here is you put on a constant uh, phase encoded gradient, and then you do a, a gradient reversals in the x direction. So you get an echo with each of these, and each echo is going to have one more step in phase encoding. Uh, as you uh, So the late echoes are going to be much more phase encoding than the early echoes. You acquire these, and then you can you can very rapidly fill up case space, uh, and and get an image for echo planar imaging. How do they do it sometimes with all these like <clears throat> sequences with multiple B knots? Uh, they'll have like a thousand, then they'll have five hundred, then they'll have fifteen hundred and two thousand, and then they'll watch it change. Like I know that for prostate imaging they do that. They'll have like, but what's your standard then? Like, what do you? I mean, is it? just to see if it gets brighter. Yeah, well, you can change the B value. B naught is the main magnetic field, so you don't change that. But you can change the B values, and uh, uh, in different structures, we'll have different kinds of diffusion, I mean, different rates of diffusion, and different B values will give you more sensitivity for the different rates of, of diffusion. Uh, Things that, um, you know, so it's areas where there is a fair amount of background diffusion, if your B is too high, you'll just get no signal and you'll get a blank image. Uh, I, I haven't done imaging where I've used multiple different B values, except for research purposes when they're trying to find out what the optimal B value would be for, for a, given, uh, a given study, we're primarily trying to find out what would be a good B value for looking at diffusion and cartilage and, and discs. Uh, and I, I have not been using this uh, recently in the prostate, so I'm not sure. OK, so, the, so that's the way diffusion imaging works. And you've, you've all used it, and you've all seen it. And generally, you establish it, and you, and you use a set of uh, pulse sequences. So you, usually, you don't tweak it much. You just establish it. This is what you use in the brain, and this is what you'd be using, say, for, for evaluating discs and so forth. <clears throat> and it's set as part of the protocols. So next, let's go to parallel imaging. Uh, 
Sean, what's parallel imaging? Um, parallel, um, it's, um, I'm going to try to describe it. It's essentially when you're collecting um, two, two sets of echoes at the same time, you're filling up um, two or three, li well, two or three lines of case space at the exact same time. Um, but I can't really describe it beyond that. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk. There are, there are many, many different ways to do this. And basically what these are are all really mathematical tricks that you can play uh, with the acquisition, understanding the, the, the acquisition. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, but what is important for all parallel imaging is that you need to use phased array coils. And we'll talk about phased array coils in the next section when we get to hardware, discussing hardware. Uh, but, but essentially what we have is, if this is a phantom, this is what the image that we're trying to obtain. This would be a good high quality image of the phantom we're looking at. If you put a coil on the top and a coil on the bottom, that what you'll find is that the coils will be much more sensitive to signal next to the coil, so you'll get bright spots next to the coil. And if you use the two coils that are connected together with a single wire, <clears throat> what you'll get is an image like this. And we used to use these kind of images and looking at the TMJs, uh, it's called a Helmholtz pair of coils. Uh, but what happens then, if, if you put the two coils there, you end up, both of them will receive the signal generally just close to the coil, and both of them will receive the noise throughout the image. So you tend to get relatively noisy images if you use coils that are connected together like this. So what we're going to be doing that we'll talk about more in, uh, later concerning how to do phased array coils is, well, what we're going to do is acquire the data from this coil separately from the data from this coil. And therefore, this coil will get the signal from here, but it'll only get the noise from, from this one coil. And the other one will get signal from the other side and only will receive noise, noise from this side so that we won't have, we won't have noise twice on, on both coils. And we'll find out later that, that we can then add these up to get higher signal to noise images. But that requires that this coil have its own set of electronics so that you basically reconstruct an image with this coil and with this coil, and then you add the images together. It's one way to look at it. Now, another little bit more sophisticated way to, to look at this also is that, that if we just acquire an image with one coil, what you'll find is you have a very characteristic distribution of signal. It's brighter next to the coil, it's darker away from it. And same with the other coil. And it turns out that uh, what we're going to be talking about is we can use this to give us spatial information so that maybe we can take less time acquiring data and get the added information about spatial orientation from information we get from the coils themselves. Now, one thing I'd like to notice here is if you have a nice image like this, that comes from completely filling up case space that we've talked about. And so this would be case space on the left. Now, if you have uh, thin line, lines next to each other, but you only acquire the center of case space, Michael, if we only acquire the center of case space, what would be the difference between an image with this case space acquisition versus this case space acquisition? You only acquire the center of case space. That's you're only acquiring the differences of contrast, and you're losing the spatial resolution, which is in the periphery. Great. So what you would get would be blurred images, like we're seeing on the right side. So so that's what happens. But this takes less time to acquire, but we ended up getting a blurred image, which isn't very good. So now, <clears throat> so let's look at this a little bit more. So here's the 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 case space acquisition on the left, which gives us a very good image. Now, instead of shrinking down and just taking lines in the center of case space, what if instead I remove some of these lines so that they're lines of case space that I don't acquire? What happens if you do that is that we are, we're still now acquiring the, the edges of case space so that the resolution is going to be maintained. But what happens, we then get wraparound artifact because by separating the lines in case space like this, it's the same thing as decreasing the field of view in this direction, which ends up with wraparound artifact. 
Now, that's easy to say, but it's hard to understand. So how, why is that the case? Well, let's go back and look at two objects that we're talking about. And remember, we're going to determine the separation of these objects uh, because of, uh, of uh, frequency encoding. So this object is going to be, let's say, at a high magnetic field. This object's going to be at a low magnetic field. So this object is going to re resonate with a high frequency. This object is going to resonate with a low frequency. Now, if we separate the lines of case space, so we only acquire a few data points, notice that there are points where these two, these two uh, frequencies, these two sine waves, over, uh, uh, intersect with one another. So if we just acquire data where these intersect, the results are such that we will be indistinguishable. We won't be able to distinguish the two. So they'll overlap one another. That's what's happening when you have wraparound artifact. So at the, the, this part of the object here, which this part of the object here is actually the circle from down below here that's wrapped around here, but it means that the object at this point and the object at this point, at these two points, will have the exact same phase encoding identity and uh, when, when we reconstruct the case space, when we do the Fourier transform, and therefore they overlap one another. However, if we sample more lines of case space, then it turns out we can separate the two because on a m many of these lines of case space now, the two sine waves have different, different values. So by sampling more lines of case space, or doing more rapid data sampling, we're able to much more accurately differentiate signals with different frequencies. And therefore, they don't overlap, and we don't get wraparound artifact. So therefore, what, what we're saying again now, let me repeat it. If you just acquire a few lines in the center of case space, you're going to lose spatial resolution. You're going to have a blurry image. If, you, if instead you only acquire a few lines, but you separate them a lot, then they're going to overlap because we're going to get aliasing and you're going to get wraparound artifact. And, and so we're trying to, we're learning a little bit about case space versus image space here. Okay, so let's think how we can use this. Uh, so I'll stop talking about that. Okay, so, so here's just some examples. Here's our high-resolution image of the brain. If we only acquire the center of case space, we get a blurry image here. If instead we just, we, we, here we only, we only uh, took data for a third of the time, so this, this would take us a third of the amount of time because we only acquired data on um, a third of the, of the lines. But if we do that and just get the center of case space, it's going to be a blurry image. If we do the same thing and basically only acquire a few lines, but we separate them, then we're going to get wraparound artifact. Now, what's going to happen with, with uh, parallel imaging is that we're going to save time by only acquiring separated lines in case space, but we're going to do mathematical tricks to fill in these dotted lines. So we're basically going to acquire a wrapped around image and we're going to do mathematical tricks to unwrap it so we end up with an image that looks like the one on the left. That's what, that's what parallel imaging is all about. So we, we can take less time acquiring and just use mathematical calculations to unwrap this wraparound artifact. Okay? Uh, and the way we're going to be able to do that is we're going to be able to use the spatial information that different coils in the phased array coils give us to, to basically give us added information that allows us to unwrap this, this spatial overlap. And this is just a kind of an example of one of the early cases of using uh, uh, parallel, uh, phase encode code images. What you find if you use a small field of view image, as you've already had experience with, you can get a high resolution image with much better signal to noise than you would with a large coil, like a big body coil. But the problem is that you have limited uh, uh, part of the body that you can image. So here's a case where we could acquire uh, 
use four separate coils, acquire four areas of the spine, all with high resolution and high, uh, high signal to noise. Now, if we combine these four coils so that they were connected electronically, then we would get the same signal to noise as if it were a big coil. So there'd be no advantage. But if we essentially, we can acquire, we can put the coil here and acquire an image, put the coil there and acquire an image, put the coil there and acquire an image, and put the coil down here and acquire an image, and then use Photoshop to stitch them back together again, and you'll get a nice high resolution image here with very good signal to noise. Or you can be more sophisticated than that. You can put these in a way that we'll talk about when we talk about uh, phase encode images and so forth, uh, such that each of these are independently connected to electronics, and they are electrically independent. And I'll explain what that is in a future lecture. If you do that, you can acquire these four images simultaneously without getting all the noise you would have in a big image, and then reconstruct it using something similar to Photoshop, but a little bit more uh, an automated fashion of that, and end up with a very high resolution with high signal to noise, but in the same time it would take you to acquire one low resolution image or one noisy image. So, so that's what uh, uh, phase and uh, that, that's what uh, we're going to do with uh, with uh, we'll talk about later. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can acquire this image, but we'll use the spatial information that these coils know about to be able to acquire an image that's wrapped around, but then unwrap it. And let me just, let's, let's go here. Okay, so. Dr. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Cruz, can you just go back again? How does it help decrease the, uh, the noise in the image? Okay. Uh, in the old days, what we'd use is what we call the license plate coil, where we'd get the entire lumbar spine and often a little bit of the thoracic spine uh, by just putting a coil on the back of the body that looked like a license plate. It was a single uh, rectangular loop of coil in the, in the back, and we would get pretty good images of the lumbar spine. But what you found is if you'd use a smaller coil, you would get less of the body image, but you'd get much better signal to noise. Because if you use a smaller coil, then more of the body you're looking at is close to the coil, and therefore, the coil is going to be much more sensitive for the signal, and you'll get better signal to noise. Uh, and, so, and we can see that's what's happening here. Now, it, it turns out that if you put four coils on the back of the spine, you hook them all together with a single wire, they'd give you the same image that you would get with the old license plate coil, and you would get a nice image, but you wouldn't get this kind of signal to noise, and you couldn't get this kind of spatial resolution because of the signal to noise. If, however, you acquire data from each of these coils independently electronically, and they go through their same amplifier sequence, and you then uh, uh, you correct the raw, you get the raw data and actually go on and pre process even separate images from these, then each of these will be much higher signal to noise images. And when you combine them together, you get much higher quality image than you would if it were just one big coil. And that's called phased array imaging. And it turns out that if you use these coils in a way in which electronically they don't talk to one another, and again, I'll discuss that more later, then we can acquire this data simultaneously. And, in, and what you get is much higher signal to noise on your image in the same amount of time that if you used a less sophisticated coil. The cost is the cost of the of the coils, and the more added software to, because it's a, a more sophisticated sequence. But the bottom line is, almost all the imaging we do right now, we use phased array coils. Are these four separate coils? They can be four or more separate coils. So, uh, so people use eight. Some people use sixteen coil arrays. And some of the scanners are equipped to even do 64, though I don't know of any coils that go up to 64 right now. Uh, so uh, so th this is phased array imaging that we use, and we use it all the time now, in order to get higher signal to noise per unit time in our imaging. But as I want to talk about now, is not so much getting higher signal to noise, 
even though we're going to need it with this technique, but, but how we can use this to do faster imaging. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, so let, let's look at it. So here, if we acquire, let, let's take this, uh, this phantom that we talked about earlier, earlier. And, and if we look at, uh, <clears throat> if we acquire fewer lines of case space in the Y direction, then as we just talked about, we'll get aliasing because that will lead to a smaller field of view. And we get an image that none of us want to look at, right? But if we look at just the, the signal that is involved in this pixel right here, the signal from that comes from two locations. Remember, this is a part of the phantom that should be mapped up here. So uh, the, the signal intensity in that pixel comes from a pixel in that part of the phantom plus a pixel in this part of the phantom. And remember, when we wrap around, what the wraparound is doing is it's taking the top of this phantom and placing it over the bottom here. And it's taking the bottom of the phantom here and placing it over the top. So this is the top of the phantom here, and it's this is placed over the mid part of the phantom. So what happens then is that that pixel in the image within the phantom itself and that pixel overlap here. And that's why we have uh, overlap. Uh, <clears throat> and, and if we look at this from coil one, from coil one with the coil is on the top, then the top of the phantom is gonna be bright. Here the top is bright. It's just wrapped onto the mid part of the coil. If we take the second coil, it's gonna be at the bottom. The bottom is gonna be bright. And here, this is the uh, the image taken from the second coil, where now the bottom is wrapped up to the to up above. And you can see that these two images look different. One acquired from the coil on top, the second one acquired from the coil on the bottom. Okay, this one has a bright uh, thing down here. This one has a bright thing up here. So here, the wraparound from the bottom is dark. Here, the wraparound from the bottom is bright. Okay. Have a, how many people have I lost so far? Okay. Good. Okay. So, <clears throat> but we don't want to look at these images. We want to look at this image. Okay. So what happens? So now we have we have a mathematical equation. That is, the signal intensity at A1 right there is a combination of the signal from here and the signal from there. So mathematically, what this looks like is signal intensity at A1 is equal to something called S11 times the actual signal, the, the actual signal intensity at point one plus S12 times the signal intensity at point two. So what is that? Let's go back here for a second. So in our real phantom, this is the pixel value at point P1 and this is the pixel value at point P2. Now, uh, uh, if we acquire an image with the coils on the top, what you will have is a distribution of signal intensity that's bright at the top and dark at the bottom. So if we just do a flood phantom using that coil, what you will find is that if everything is the same signal intensity, we will have signal intensity that will be vary in two dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> and it will be brightest right by the coil, and it will fall off as we get away from the coil uh, in different directions. So if we look at the, the signal profile of intensity coming from coil one at any point in space in two dimensions, then uh, <clears throat> that will give us a calibration factor that will be, that, and that calibration factor is called S, and it will depend upon the position in, in two dimensions, one dimension and two dimensions. So if S11 is the signal intensity from coil one that a flood phantom would have at point one, uh, uh, that would give a value. And if it was at point two, that would be a second value. So these are, these are those calibration factors 
from coil one at the two different locations. Here are the calibration factors from coil two at those different uh, at those same locations. Uh, and then here are the signal intent. These are the real signal intensities that we want to find. P1 and P2 are the real signal intensities from the real phantom at this location, oops, at this location and at that location there. So it turns out that mathematically then, the, in the wrapped around image, the signal intensity from point A1 is the sum of the wrapped signal at these two points. This is from coil one, this is from coil two. So what we have, have right now is uh, a mathematical set of equations, two equations and two unknowns. And as you all remember from your algebra days back in junior high, if you have two linear equations with two unknowns, you can solve those. In fact, we can then take these two equations and solve them for what, what the pixel value is at point one and what the pixel value is at point two. What that means is that we can take the, the signal information from this point, from this image, and the signal intensity from the point of, from that image, knowing the calibration of the two coils, we can then, uh, then calculate the true signal intensity from these two points, which means that you can unwrap the images. And when you unwrap it, you'll get a signal that looks, you'll get something that looks like this. Now, and typically it'll be brighter next to the two coils, because of the coil effects. But then if you know what this variation in signal is gonna be, you can then correct it by a intensity correction algorithm and you end up with a uniform image on the right. So the, what parallel imaging does then, and there are many different ways to do this, is that we basically take less time, we acquire f fewer lines of case space. So that takes us less time to acquire, but we end up with wrapped images which we can unwrap by using mathematical equations that are essentially using the, the spatial information that we obtain from the, from the phased array coils to be able to create unwrapped images. And I'll show a few more slides here, but I'm not gonna talk about them in detail. There are many mathematical tricks to do this. And you don't want me to go through all of them, and I'm not an expert enough to really do it very well. They're all variations on this theme, mathematical tricks thing. But what they all share in common is that in order to be able to do this and get unique values that give good images, uh, you, you, there, there are some requirements. One is that the phased array coils be electrically independent, which you need for phased array imaging anyway. Also, uh, for if you, if you double, if you have the amount of time you take, so if you take half the number of case space lines, then you need to have at least two coils that are independent, not only electrically independent, but also geometrically, they have to give very different information. Uh, if you want to remove two out of every three lines of case space so that your imaging time is now a third, then you need at least three coils. And if it's four, you need at least four coils. And it turns out generally you need more than that because there is some crosstalk that the coils don't give unique spatial information the way you have to arrange them for the human body. But, but so you usually need more coils than that uh, or you start getting artifacts. We'll look at some of the artifacts. The amount that you speed up the imaging is called the R factor. So if uh, I only acquire half as many lines of case space, that's an R factor of two, which requires at least two phase array coils, usually three or four, to get good data. And if we acquire only one line of case space for every three lines, then you have an R factor of three and so forth. And if you push it, now, if, if you have an R factor of, of say, R, uh, well, the higher the R factor, if you have very good imaging, uh, as you increase the R factor, you decrease the signal to noise. So the amount of signal to noise you get really goes kind of as the square root of the R factor, uh, you drop. So if you have an R factor of two, then you're gonna lose a square root of, signal of two of signal to noise. And if it's three, you're gonna, you're gonna lose more than that. So one of the things that you can't really use uh, parallel imaging 
unless you have very good quality signal to noise. If you're if you're already starved with signal to noise, then there's no point in using parallel imaging because you'll just get noisy images. So it means this technique is a better technique at higher field strengths, typically three three T. And you're trying to save time. If you're already having to go to multiple necks, then you're better off just dropping to to one next rather than going to parallel imaging. <clears throat> okay, so, and then this is just uh, many ways to do this. You can, uh, uh, they're all variations on the same theme. And here you can see the wrapped around images. You use these mathematical reconstructions to unwrap the image. And here are just other examples. And you can use combination of different kinds of uh, techniques. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to go through all of these right now. Let me just skip this. And I, I won't go through what crop is. Now, the bottom line is that the signal to noise then is a signal to noise full divided by a, a factor called G times the square root of R. So basically, the larger R is the more loss of signal to noise you get. And this is just an example of doing increased R factors where you get more and more a wraparound artifact. Uh, and if you don't have the G factor is really based upon uh, geometrically how the coils are. And if there is, a, if the coils are separated for position to position where they give unique information, then, then you can get, uh, 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 you can do the maximum amount of time savings without getting artifact. <clears throat> but if you try to do too large of an R factor, more than your coil arrangement can, can support, then you start getting artifacts like we see here at the bottom. These are the unwrapped images. And if you use too large of an R, R factor based upon your coil arrangement, you'll end up getting artifacts because you start getting aliasing because you're, you're not getting unique uh, spatial information from each of the coils. Some of the coils are giving similar spatial information, and therefore you're, you're not able to completely unwrap the image. Therefore, if you use the R factor, if it's too high, you can get wraparound artifact, like kind of what we're seeing there, or you can get these what looks like motion artifact, because you're, you're pushing it, trying to, trying to uh, uh, make, the, make the R factor too high, or you can get wraparound artifact like we're seeing here. So if you start seeing these images, uh, and you're using uh, parallel imaging, and you know you're press, you're pushing the the time savings too high. And in the grappa, you you kind of get uh, what looks like noise added to the image. Using uh, okay, any question about uh, parallel imaging? And at three T, you'll you'll we use it a lot, especially in body imaging. Okay. Uh, Like when they want to decide to use parallel imaging, like yes, the tech. I mean, so you want to do a body image, so you're just going to press okay. You want to do parallel yeah. imaging. Yeah. Add that. Typically, the parallel images are built into the uh, to the the pulse sequence. So if you create a pulse sequence for a certain uh, body technique or other technique where you are going to you you already know what phase array coils alignment you're going to do then it's built into the sequence so that it, it acquires the data with, with parallel imaging. An area that we use it all the time in musculoskeletal imaging is when we do uh, uh, cube imaging, the 3D imaging. The uh, fast spin echo 3D imaging would be far too long to be able to use if we couldn't use parallel imaging. Uh, as it is with parallel imaging, it's a five to seven minute sequence. If you didn't do parallel imaging, it would be a 20 minute sequence. So uh, for spin echo 3D imaging, it, you, you really have to do some form of parallel imaging. And then it depends on what coil you have as to what R and what signal to noise you have as to what R factor you can use to speed up the imaging time. If you guys spend some time at Tower or work on the, the 3T or some of our newer scanners, it might be nice to play around a little bit with it with the text. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? <clears throat>
Okay, uh, Yuri, what is spectroscopy? Uh, spectroscopy is a technique where you where you take uh, uh, the signal from a, a voxel and uh, uh, analyze it uh, for uh, you analyze their resonance from uh, from that uh, voxel um, and uh, uh, split it uh, split up the nuclear resonance based on uh, individual uh, atoms or compound. Okay, uh, that, that, that's, that's good, it's close. Uh, <clears throat> so here's a typical uh, spectroscopy sequence. Now, <clears throat> what you will see, the big difference between spectroscopy and imaging is when we acquire the image out here, there are no gradients on. Remember, when we do an image, when we acquire the image, we put on a frequency encoding gradient, which then separates out the tissues in that direction, which allows us, gives us spatial information. With spectroscopy, we, we don't do that. So what you we're going to do with spectroscopy is we're going to put gradients on in three different locations, which will mean, and, and so what these do will localize the voxel in 3D space. So then what we have when we acquire the echo here is that this echo is only coming from the voxel determined by the gradients in, in, in 3D space. But when we get the signal, uh, we're not spreading it out in any direction based upon any sort of frequency encoding. Uh, so in this particular case, it's called a press sequence where we have, we, we, uh, create a, a slice in the a perpendicular to the y direction by putting a y gradient on at the 90 degree pulse. We put an x gradient on in the 180 degree pulse. <clears throat> and therefore we have two interacting, inter, intersecting slices. And this will then give a prism in one direction, which only sees both of these two pulses. And then when you give the second 180 degree pulse, you put in a gradient in the third dimension and therefore only the nuclei that uh, see all three of these pulses, which will just be in one voxel, will actually give a resonance. And therefore, all the signal here will just be from that voxel in the body. So by th this way, we can, we can define exactly where we want to receive the signal. Now, the signal, uh, you can do that uh, with that technique, you can do a chemical shift imaging technique where, we, where you do phase encoding in two different directions. So there, there are several ways to localize the, the, uh, uh, the sequence. But then you'll, you'll end up, then when we receive the signal, we receive a large bandwidth there. And what we see now is instead of uh, the frequency giving us spatial information now, now variations in frequency are going to tell us spe uh, specifically uh, how many nuclei are resonating at a different frequency. So now with a, uh, with a uh, spectroscopy, what we're seeing is, is uh, a map, a histogram basically, of the number of nuclei which are resonating at a different frequency, at a given frequency. And way over here somewhere would be water, which would be really, really high. And then what we're seeing here, split off by different parts per million, are little peaks where we have more nuclei here, more nuclei here, more nuclei there, very few, few nuclei here that are resonating at that frequency. And what causes these nuclei to resonate at these frequencies is that these are protons that are embedded at certain locations in molecules where they're getting a certain amount of magnetic field shielding so that these molecules are, are, are in a magnetic field where their Lamar frequency is exactly at this location, which is separate from free water because they're at a lower magnetic field due to the shielding electrons in the large macromolecule. And therefore you, you get peaks and these peaks are like fingerprints. Every macromolecule has a separate different peaks because the protons are located at different locations with different electron clouds around them and therefore they're in slightly different magnetic fields. <clears throat>
And this then is a very powerful technique in biochemistry to analyze complicated molecules. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of experience. So each of these peaks can really be assigned to very specific uh, uh, atoms within molecules. And different molecules are made up with their atomic configuration. So you can actually get uh, uh, accurate measurements of concentrations of different complex macromolecules into, inside the body by using spectroscopy. Uh, <clears throat> where this has been used, uh, and, and some of the peaks can be ATP peaks, if, if well, that's really more if you're in phosphate uh, resonance, uh, but uh, a lot of these peaks have to do with specific uh, molecules. <clears throat> some are in the lipid area, uh, and some, some have to do with other chemicals. Now, where we're interested in what we're trying to get started in, uh, in uh, spine imaging is we're looking for peaks that have to do with anaerobic metabolites like lactate and uh, uh, alanine and things uh, as markers of, of anaerobic uh, metabolism and secondary pain generators. <clears throat> Here's just a, a patient who uh, was a marathon runner. This is a, a spectrum of the muscle before and after running. <clears throat> and uh, you can see the difference that, that uh, well, what happens before and after running is that you start losing some of the molecules that are associated with stores of energy. Uh, and you can actually then image energy depletion when you look at the, the difference image between the two. Notice that this particular peak was very high at the beginning and it dropped down significantly after running. Uh, if you do phosphate imaging, you can actually look at the uh, ATP concentrations and ADP uh, using spectroscopy. So that's basically what the way basic spectroscopy works. It's actually very simple. The only problem is that the human body has is such a complicated mixture of, of biochemicals inside uh, each voxel of the human body that the spectrum can become very complicated and difficult uh, often to evaluate. Usually in a biochemical environment, you're, you're dealing more with pure chemicals, and therefore the complexity of the peaks can be bad enough as if it's a large macromolecule, but it's not nearly as bad as in the living human body. Okay, any, any questions about spectroscopy? Okay. Uh, you know, why don't we stop here? Because next I'd like to talk about flow effects uh, so that, because these can produce artifacts. A lot of the current sequences we use try to really minimize a lot of these, but I think it's important to understand these because we do see flow artifacts all the time in images. Uh, so why don't we, tomorrow, why don't we go through flow artifacts and we'll try to then end up with pulse sequences tomorrow and then uh, maybe Friday start talking about the hardware. Okay. What spectroscopy is looking look at asteroids and looking for space? Oh, the question was: Is spectroscopy the same as when you look into space? And, and the answer is, uh, when you look into space, uh, uh, you you definitely do, do spectroscopy there. Uh, Instead of looking at the signal from resonances of nuclei, what we're actually looking at is the light, frequencies of light coming through the light beam. And uh, for instance, the way you measure distances in a uh, cosmic sense is because of the expansion of the universe, uh, the, uh, Substances in the universe that are very, very far away are moving away from us at very high speeds. And if, you, if you're emitting light from an object, if it's stationary, then the light will have a given frequency. Let's just say blue light. But now if you take that object and have it move away from us very rapidly, then it's, it's emitting to us, but it's moving away very rapidly. And, and therefore, the light wave coming to us will look like it has a much longer wavelength than it would be if it were just stationary. If it's moving toward us, it looks like it's going to look like it has a much shorter wavelength. It's called the Doppler effect. 
and you're all probably familiar with it, you've heard about it, but if you listen to a train uh, coming toward you, it'll have a high-pitched sound, and then if it passes you by, all of a sudden it drops immediately to low pitch. And uh, that's the Doppler effect, and that's when it's coming towards you, it's sending a, a frequency, but because it's moving forward, it's collapsing that, that wavelength into smaller wavelengths, and we hear it as a higher pitch. And then when it moves away, the opposite happens. It's, it's lengthening them because in the time it takes to create a wavelength, it's actually moved away from us, which has the effect of lengthening the wavelength. And therefore, if you take, no, uh, if you take uh, light signals from a known source where we know in, in a resting state what frequency it is, and then if you look and see the Doppler shift, so it goes from, a, say, blue down into the red range, then you can actually calculate the speed at which that object is moving away from us. <clears throat> and since we know that there is a very good relationship called the Hubble parameter between speeds and distance, we can then calculate the distance that the object is away from us or how closer it is back to the, to the time of the Big Bang. Uh, so spectroscopy is used that way to determine distances. But also we, we also use spectroscopy the same way we're using it here. Uh, a lot of chemicals uh, will, uh, when they're heated up, will emit uh, light rays of different frequencies. And by looking at the spectrum in it, we can determine what the chemicals are. You all did it back in chemistry where you take something like sodium and you'd burn it, and you would look at the light coming off of it, and sodium emits light at very specific frequencies. Uh, so that then you can see how much sodium, how much hydrogen, how much other atoms are like in a star, for instance, because you know, there are two ways to use it with stars. One is a star will emit uh, light, and if there's a lot of sodium in it, then you'll see a lot of emission at the sodium frequency. But on the other hand, <clears throat> if you have clouds of sodium around a star, or let's say clouds of hydrogen around a star, then they will absorb frequencies at a very specific frequency. They'll absorb light frequencies that can kick an electron from one orbital to another. So what you, you will see with a lot of stars that have uh, atmospheres around them is that you'll look at their spectrum, it'll be nice and smooth, except there'll be black lines in it where you have a dropout of the, of the light. And that's because you've got clouds of atoms around between our line of sight to that star that are absorbing the light at that frequency and then emitting it at a lower frequency. So you can get information both about the content of the star as well as the contents of interstellar space between us and the star just by looking at the spectrum. So it's very similar. Any other questions? All right, we'll do it again tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you.